this is a classical example. If you give a bolus of dose without a infusion, typically concentration will fall down like this. It will, if you give a bolus, it will shoot up and it will fall down because you are not infusing further. If you give a infusion without low dose, initial concentration peak will not come. Slowly it will go up to reach this point. Whereas if you give a loading dose, which will immediately bring a high level, along with the infusion, typically the curve will be like that, the uppermost curve. So one of these curves will be given and the examiner will ask a common sense question. There is no big rocket science about it. So this is another example that if you use the loading dose, the main advantage is there is always for every drug there is a minimum effective concentration where its uh, effect is being shown. That is achieved faster unlike you give only the maintenance dose. If you don't give loading dose and only give maintenance dose, the effective concentration for it to be achieved will take longer is what need to be remembered. So loading dose is equal to the amount of the drug in the body divided by the bioavailability into the salt fraction. This is what you have to basically remember. Another way is amount of the drug in the body is calculated by the volume of distribution into the target concentration. So ultimately what is the formula of the uh, loading dose? Concentration, target concentration, volume of distribution goes into numerator. The reason loading dose is proportional to volume of distribution, directly proportional. That's the reason any drug which has got a larger volume of distribution require a larger loading dose. That's what you need to remember. Divided by what is the denominator? In the denominator, you have bioavailability into salt fraction will give you classically the loading dose is what you need to ultimately remember. So, what kind of drugs? You have one drug A, drug B, doctor. Do you want to give loading dose to every drug? Or is there any special important feature that mandates you to give a loading dose. The drugs that have a long half-life are the ones who deserve to have a loading dose is what you need to basically remember. How will you remember this? How will you remember uh, this important factor? Long half-life. That means if your brain is so dull, and it takes a long time for you to read the book. Definitely you require a bullet session like this, like a loading dose. Quick loading dose that is going to really help you because you don't have time now to read the pharmacology book sitting on the side of a Goa beach and slowly reading one page one day and remaining time playing with your TNC. You don't have time now. That's the reason you require a loading dose. So, longer the half-life having drugs require, deserve to have the loading dose is what need to be remembered. Now, let us talk about the maintenance dose. I am very happy to see 200 plus students online. So, please pass on the SMS, post it in your WhatsApp group of your classmates. Invite them. Uh, for this evening session where we all meet for the purpose of preparation of NEET PG. We all juggle on about 50, 60 questions every evening and that keeps us alive, awake and then go for the exam. And very crucial points, must, must, to, must kind of points, we will try to discuss few topics every day. So that is going to be the goal. Maintenance dose. It is desired plasma concentration into clearance is the way you calculate maintenance dose. Then uh, when do you call it as a steady state concentration? The point where the elimination of the drug and the availability of the drug, if the both rates become equal, that is called steady state plasma concentration. 
Now let us talk the business. What is the bullet about it? Examiner's favorite question is, if you give any drug, after how many half lives will it be reaching the steady state concentration is what the examiner is going to ask you. What is your answer doc? Four and half lifetimes, half lives is the time before a drug reaches 4.5 is the number which you need to basically remember. Then what is meant by clearance? The amount of the volume of the plasma which is cleared out of the drug is basically called clearance. And uh, clearance into plasma concentration minus rate of elimination will give you the excretion rate is what you have to ultimately remember. Now comes the therapeutic index. What is the meaning of it? Typically the toxic dose divided by therapeutic dose will give you therapeutic index and higher it is the safer is the drug or you know very well. Now there are two important uh, concentrations which examiner want to know what is the definition of them. What is meant by peak level? What is meant by trough level? Typically the concentration of the drug 4 hours after giving the dose is called peak level and 2 hours before giving the dose is called trough level. If the trough level is too high then that will tell you hey give this particular drug little less often and if the peak level is very high that tells you that please decrease the dosage in the next time when you are dosing. So that is how you interpret the peak level and the trough level are important because trough level will decide you how often you need to give the dose. Some drugs are given 4th hourly, 6th hourly, 8th hourly, TID, BID, etc. Right? So it all is decided by the trough level and the peak level is the one which decides whether you need to alter the dosage is what I want to understand to all of you. Now comes our topic antibacterials. Let us quickly run through the various antibacterials. You all know all the antibacterial drugs are divided into bacterostatic and bactericidal as all of you know very well. Which kind of drugs are bacterostatic doctor? Protein synthesis inhibitors are considered to be bacterostatic. What is an ex exception about it? Aminoglycosides also block the protein synthesis but still they are bactericidal is what you have to basically remember. Then what drugs typically are the classical examples of bacterostatic? Chloramphenicol, clindamycin, erythromycin, sulfamethoxazole, tetracycline, trimethoprim etc etc they are all fundamentally the bacterostatic drugs is what I want to underscore to all of you. Whereas cephalosporins, fluoroquinolones, metronidazole, penicillin that is the cell wall synthesis inhibitor and nucleus inhibitors they are the ones which are considered to be bactericidal and they will be causing a irreversible killing is what I want to underscore to all of you. <coughs> so if you look at the bactericidal tell me three four points favorite questions about the, of the examiner. Cell wall synthesis inhibitors are bactericidal and if there is any host resistance the bactericidal are less resilient is what you need to remember. Bacterostatic will take a little longer time whereas bactericidal are much more faster in action is what you need to remember. And bactericidal there is a more flexibility in terms of the dosing interval whereas bacterostatic they inhibit the RNA synthesis, protein synthesis, they inhibit the growth and reproduction of the bacteria is what need to be remembered and basically bacterostatic will be acting like a co-actor for the person's own host immune system is what need to be remembered. Now comes P450. If the P450 induces and inhibitors 
if they are not in your pocket and you are going for need pg no it is like a passport which you need to carry you wear a full hand shirt and under the sleeves you have to put a few lists you know that no how to copy in the exam otherwise they will also teach those things in the evening session so you need to be doubly sure there are certain things like real bullet like a real bomb you should uh, uh, bomb on the examiner there will be about some 50 60 lists i will send you the pdf of that must read list there are so many books with so many lists unnecessary crap but there are 50 60 emergency lists that need to be there in your pocket which you should not basically forget hmm? now p450 dependent drugs are which one you can remember women's department warfarin digoxin estrogen phenytoin theophylline is what you can be able to remember they are all p450 dependent so inhibitors of P450, you may be having your own way of uh, a mnemonic. So fluoroquinolones, INS, DILDR, some sulfur drugs, macrolide, semiterone, semiterine, ketoconazole, grape, grapefruit juice. Frequently I do smack grapefruit juice is a one way of remembering. Then P450 inducers, get ABC and PQRs. So, get is grisopulvin, alcohol, A, B is barbiturate, C is carbamazepine, P is phenytoin, Q is quinidine, R is rifampicin, and S is St. John's Ward. These are the things that you need to basically remember. Yes, Arun is asking, sir, yesterday there was there no session? No, no, no. Every day there will be session. Even on Deepavali day also, we will celebrate a session right so that is the deal that we all have unless i am indisposed because of uh, every three within three months there is no guarantee when we will be succumbed to influenza right unless there is a very mandating thing we are completely jobless we like to spend time with you so uh, please do come to the session and participate now what drugs are called anti staphylococcal toxin Amoxicillin clavulanate, even the old grandma who didn't pass fifth class also know nowadays. Ah, that clavum only, you know, send me. That's what they will say. Augmentin only, you know, I already took augmentin. That's what my grandma used to say. Ampicillin sulbactam is also anticyclococcal. Methicillin, nephicillin, cephalosporins, vancomycin, macrolides. These are all called staphylococcal, anti-staphylococcal drugs. Which drugs are called anti pseudomonal? Anti pseudomonal. Ticarcillin clavulanic acid, piperacillin tazobactam, carbenicillin, septazidine, cephepine. So many times this bullet was asked in the exam. Anti pseudomonal cephalosporins, septazidine, cephepine, vancomycin, chloroquinolone, seminoglycosides, these are all considered to be. Anti pseudomonal drugs is what I want to underscore to all of you. Now, another favorite question of the examiner is uh, hospital abscesses. What is the common causes? Day 1, if you see the 1 to 3, if you see abscess, staph aureus, and uh, day 4 to 7, it is it becomes subacute. So, streptococcus viridans. After day 7, if you find a hospital abscess, commonly it is the anaerobes, is what you have to ultimately remember. Then, what are the drugs that lead to myositis? Umpteen number of times this question was asked. You can remember rips, it rips the muscle. Rifampicin, INH, prednisolone, statins. They are the ones, after you give statins, sometimes patient will say, Oh, doctor. I am unable to get up from the squatting position. What is the reason? The reason is once more myositis can be the one which can be responsible. That is the reason immediately you should do the serum enzyme levels, CPK levels in order to know whether there is any myositis. Three drugs disulfiram reaction which you should not forget. Metadazole, cephalosporins, procarbazine. These are the three drugs 
and disulfiram reaction favorite question of the examiner.